today I'm going to make a highly fluorescent compound incidentally called fluorescin. Fluorescin is used extensively in fields outside of chemistry to help visualize and trace different phenomena due to its extremely high visibility. For example, fluorescent eye drops are used in eye exams to diagnose various ocular diseases. Fluorescent is also used in histology, serology, and general microscopy to highlight specific structures, as well as in geology and botany to trace the movement of water through everything from waterways to plants. Anyway, making this chemical is actually an extremely straightforward process, and making the reagents for this process is the truly difficult part if you don't already have access to them. To get started, I simply weigh out 3 grams or 0.02 moles of phthalic anhydride and 4.5 grams or 0.04 grams of resorcinol. The phthalic anhydride here is reagent grade, but I made the resorcinol myself, so the coloration and purity are a bit off. These chemicals are both transferred to a small flask along with just a few drops of concentrated sulfuric acid. You could also maybe grind these together in a mortar and pestle first, but they melt together anyway, so I didn't bother. The flask is then placed in an oil bath that is then heated to between 185 and 195 degrees Celsius and left for 30 minutes. You can also add a bit of zinc or aluminum chloride here as a catalyst, which might help your yield, but again, I didn't bother. Anyway, what's happening here is called a Friedel-Crafts reaction between one molecule of phthalic anhydride and two molecules of the resorcinol. This is technically an 11-step reaction, which I'll try to explain as quickly as I can. Now, essentially the first step here is a protonation of the phthalic anhydride by sulfuric acid shown here in step 1 to produce an electrophilic carbocation. This reactive intermediate then bonds to one molecule of resorcinol which subsequently rearranges to regenerate the sulfuric acid catalyst. The next step is a dehydration where the same oxygen from step one is protonated again, resulting in the formation of a water molecule which readily leaves. The removal of this water results in another carbocation which immediately reacts with a second molecule of resorcinol which again rearranges to regenerate the sulfuric acid. Next, two adjacent OH groups of the resorcinol molecules bond together, with the displacement of another molecule of water closing the central ring. The final step of this reaction is kind of complex to try and explain, but essentially electrons from this OH group here move down to the ring, displacing a hydrogen ion and forming a double bond between the oxygen and its carbon. The displaced electrons continue moving down the structure until they reach this oxygen, which results in a ring opening. Once the ring opens, the hydrogen that was displaced now bonds to the electronegative oxygen and the reaction is complete. Now, in terms of what you'll actually see, the reaction mixture will become increasingly dark orange as the reaction proceeds and fluorescent is formed. And this is simply because pure fluorescent is an orange to brick red color. Once this mixture has spent about 30 minutes or so reacting, I went ahead and cut the heat and removed the flask from the oil bath. Once this was allowed to cool, I then added 40 milliliters of ethyl acetate along with 10 milliliters of water to help dissolve and break up the fluorescent. Diethyl ether actually probably would have been a better choice here, um, but I don't use that unless I have to because it's kind of annoying to make, while ethyl acetate I can just buy at the store. Regardless, it ended up taking a super long time to dissolve, so eventually I just put the flask in a sonicator to help free up the stir bar and completely dissolve my crude product. Once it had completely dissolved, I transferred the solution to a small separatory funnel and drained away the lower water layer, which mostly contains unreacted resorcinol and phthalic anhydride. This was then rinsed with 50 milliliters of distilled water, and I decided to drain the water away under a black light to see if I had indeed formed fluorescent, which you can clearly see I did. This was then rinsed one final time with 50 milliliters of a saturated sodium chloride solution, which was again drained away and discarded before finally collecting the upper organic layer which contained my fluorescent. This was allowed to sit overnight to allow the ethyl acetate to evaporate, but even after drying a few days, the fluorescent was gummy and far from dry. I tried baking it in an oven, vacuum desiccation, and heated vacuum desiccation, but I never really could get this stuff totally dry. Worried I'd end up destroying this stuff by trying too hard to dry it out, I decided to go ahead and weigh it, which gave me a final mass of 6.4 grams, 
representing a 95.1% yield. I wouldn't take this number very seriously though, as there is still a mass variation in these watch glasses of around plus or minus half a gram, and this product still contains a small amount of water, which, um, you know, is going to throw it off somewhat. Instead, I would just say that my yield was, quote, satisfactory. Anyway, after this, I resumed trying to remove my water with no real success. Eventually, I just decided to roll my resinous fluorescent out into a long piece, cut it into smaller pieces, and then put it into a vial for storage. A good deal of the fluorescent, however, remained stuck hard to the surface of the watch glass I was trying to dry it on, and I decided to use this to demonstrate the compound. To that end, I added some 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide solution to the caked on fluorescent. These two chemicals react to form the sodium salt of fluorescent, which is immensely more soluble in water than pure fluorescent. Once I dissolved it all this way, I transferred it to a centrifuge tube for storage. As you can see, the concentrated solution of sodium fluorescent here is a dark orange, nearly red color, but in dilute solution it becomes greenish yellow. This is because in solution, fluorescent is green by reflection and orange by transmission. As a result, dilute solutions appear yellowish green, but concentrated solutions appear straight orange, as nearly all incident emission is reabsorbed by the solution itself. This effect becomes dramatically more noticeable when adding the concentrated solution to a large volume of water, especially under UV light. To that point, fluorescent is probably best known for its intense fluorescence under UV light. In its deprotonated form, fluorescent absorbs long-wave UV light around 495 nanometers and then emits green light around 520 nanometers. The exact absorbance wavelength is actually pH dependent, but fluorescent will absorb at 460 nanometers across all pH values, which is referred to as its isobestic point. I got a lot of good footage here, but what was most amazing in person was seeing how much light a beaker of this stuff would generate when placed on top of a UV light. It's not possible to appreciate properly on camera, but when I placed this beaker on top of a UV light, the room went immediately from too dark to see anything to fully illuminated in a bright green light. In any case, the rest of the video is essentially just footage I got playing around with this stuff under UV light and you can feel free to keep watching if you'd like. I also plan to use the fluorescent I made here in a future video to make a couple different dyes, if there's any interest. Anyway, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok or YouTube, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.